Hello everybody. Welcome to this webinar about advanced natural and mixed mode ventilation design. Uh, let me see here. I think we are quite a few people now. Yep. Okay, good. Okay, welcome to this webinar. Uh, we have been very excited about this. Um, uh, I just have some practical information to begin with. Hopefully everyone can hear me. And uh, we have scheduled this webinar for around uh, 60 minute uh, time. And of course, if you have any question, uh, you should be able to uh, assign these uh, in the in the questionnaire uh, module uh, to the right side uh, where it says question. And in that you can uh, address all the questions you have. All the questions um, going to the agenda, all the questions will be addressed at the very end of the presentation, so we will have a, a Q&A session. So here with me today is also uh, Ed, uh, Dean, Edward Dean, uh, who is a principal at uh, Berheim uh, plus Dean Inc. And he will explain you um, about uh, the design and performance of natural ventilation system uh, through uh, different case studies uh, of different, uh, you can say, zero net energy buildings in California and which lesson that he has learned uh, from those ones. Furthermore, my name is Yannick Roth and I am a senior building performance engineer at Window Master and uh, I will uh, mainly focus on how these, uh, you can say, problems can be avoid, avoided uh, through uh, some uh, technologies that is available at the US market. Okay, so this is uh, yeah, the agenda, so Edward Dean would start out uh, with his presentation, uh, followed by me, and at the very end we will have the Q&A session. You will still have the possibility to answer, or to have your, to give us uh, questions uh, along the presentations, and then we will handle these ones uh, at the very end of it. Okay, but uh, I will give the presentation forth to Ed, and then he will explain us what he has found out uh, in these different case studies. Here you go, Ed. So, that's brilliant. So we just have to, we can see your screen at, you just have to unmute yourself and then we should be, everything should be good. Okay, so I think uh, it finally responded to the microphone icon. Uh, so I presume everyone can hear me. Um, I'm going to go through uh, this um, at a good pace. Um, we're going to, I'm going to talk about case studies, um, particularly from the point of view of natural ventilation as a design strategy, as one of the design strategies. And um, oh, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so I'm going to uh, look at three buildings in particular in California that we looked at early. Um, and uh, I will explain each one and uh, where natural ventilation fits in, very importantly to each one. And maybe most importantly, what were the lessons learned? What these were basically prototype or early, early zero net energy buildings. And uh, of course, when the first time through anything, you learn a lot of things to do better the next time. And there were lessons learned in these three buildings. Although they were all very successful, they were a natural, they were um, zero net energy proven to be with uh, all the data. So uh, they uh, succeeded, but there were nevertheless things that were learned in the process. Uh, so uh, what's happening in California, and I, I assume that it's uh, applicable in other climates that are similar, um, is we're moving to zero net energy buildings and it's uh, very soon, relatively speaking, in terms of the life of the building, uh, there are code requirements coming up uh, in 2020, 2025, and 2030 
um, where all buildings will be required to be designed as natural ventilation, uh, sorry, <laughs> as zero net energy buildings, and natural ventilation is going to be a, a large component of that. Um, these uh, buildings and many others are documented in a publication. Uh, there, have, there have been two volumes so far, and there are two more coming out as we research very carefully all the buildings that are going up, and more and more every um, year there are additional zero net energy buildings to look at. Uh, it's mandated that these books were mandated by the Public Utilities Commission and sponsored by uh, locally Pacific Gas and Electric Company. And um, you can get them on Amazon, as it turns out. It's, uh, it's a nonprofit publication, but nevertheless, it's available on Amazon. Um, the, um, as I said, these are uh, successful zero net energy buildings. Nevertheless, there are uh, lessons learned that we want to look at. Um, and uh, we're a little um, uh, focused on one kind of climate in California because most of the population centers in the state occur in this uh, very common um, climate zone, the marine climate zone. It's generally dry um, and not humid. And there are some Central Valley. What we're doing is looking at the case studies in the Central Valley where it's very hot during the summer. And we're finding that the same um, methods can be applied, although it won't be over the entire year, which is the case in, in the, the, the uh, marine climate. Uh, the thing about the marine climate in, um, is that temperatures are always in the range of the comfort zone, more or less, and on average. And we get, we get fairly large daily swings of temperatures, so it's generally cooler at night than it is during the day. And that's primarily because it's rather dry. But um, that's the setup that you see here, the San Francisco or Northern California climate. And then if you go south where it's warmer, it's not much different. It's a little hotter in the summertime. But it's a perfect setup for the use of natural ventilation for cooling. Now, in this, all the buildings so far that we've looked at uh, adopted the same strategies these five strategies are fundamental to making a zero net energy building. You to reduce the energy use of the building so that you can minimize the size of, of the PV or photo, solar photovoltaic system that's required. Uh, you Generally, you can fit uh, that photo, solar photovoltaic system on the roof of the building or nearby on a canopy or something. And uh, it matches the load, the energy used in the building, if you can get the load down to um, about half or, or two-thirds of what is normally done in practice. As I'm broadly speaking here. Um, and what we want to do, what I want to do, is focus on the second strategy of natural ventilation uh, uh, on these three buildings that I selected because they use the same technique for each of the three in slightly different ways. Um, so the first one is a building uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, which is used for uh, training people actually in uh, the electrician's trade. So it's a union type of project. And it is a zero energy building. Here's a floor plan. You can see it's fairly large with classrooms, uh, meeting rooms, and office space. It's about 50,000 square feet. So it's a pretty big building. Originally, it was uh, it, it is a renovation, which is interesting, and is uh, tilt-up concrete panels. It had fixed windows, a solid roof, no skylights really, and uninsulated walls. It was built back in the 1970s when they they there wasn't an energy cold in, in the state. Um, so the natural ventilation design strategy is applied to this building, and as common to, to the other two uh, case studies as well is you provide the, the bring air into the building from outside when it is uh, good to use it for cooling. You can always bring in the fresh air, minimum requirement, et cetera. Um, and, uh, but you can use, use the outdoor air for cooling for most of the year. Um, then if you pre-cool the structure by night purging, um, night ventilation, you can cool it structure enough so that it takes care of the cooling requirement during the hot time of the year, which is not very much in the marine climate zone. Uh, so the combination of uh, ventilation during the, the day, when during the swing seasons and during the winter, 
Uh, and the a combination of that with night purging during the few months where you would ordinarily require mechanical cooling uh, combines to displace that cooling energy requirement. And they did this by uh, retrofitting the fixed windows, and obviously you need to do that if you're going to vent naturally ventilate the building. Um, and the windows are automatically operating and controlled by um, the central system. <clears throat> they, had, they had added roof monitors, which created an, with exhaust belt, vents built in, so you could get across ventilation. When you have a big floor plate, it's um, important that you get uh, ways to get the air to move through the intermediate rooms. Uh, they used air transfer ducts for that, and uh, we had um, they had the designers had this distributed a, uh, HV, uh, HVAC units <coughs> for the mixed mode operation. Um, I'll explain a little bit about that. Uh, so here is a picture of uh, the retrofitted um, original fixed windows. Uh, they didn't uh, put them in every single one, but uh, periodically uh, uh, set in those windows. Um, <clears throat> these are the roof monitors that had to be located for structural reasons in particular places, but they get daylight and most uh, importantly, they get those vents uh, for the cross ventilation. And for the interior rooms, as I said, they have um, transfer ducts to get air flowing through uh, to those rooms and then up and out through the uh, monitors. Um, <clears throat> and this is a typical interior room, a class is in session. <clears throat> um, so what's the lesson learned for this project? Um, and this is very common for all three buildings <clears throat> that, that the control systems uh, we found, um, they each have communication protocols built into them and they required a system integrator, actually a person who is very skilled at the controls programming, to integrate the programs, integrate the communication uh, protocols to the central, uh, to a central uh, integrated control system. And in this case, the um, consultant decided to use um, a, a um, public, publicly available. Uh, source. Uh, it was not a proprietary uh, program, so this one is called Opendium. And uh, and to, they had, to, fortunately, because I guess uh, they were electricians and they were uh, smart enough to know that, that this was something that they would run into, they had that, that consultant on board uh, during the design phases and then he, he continued during early occupancy to make sure the system worked right. So it turned out that they did this very well, but this was uh, an, an important. And that the, the fundamental thing is that there is in the U.S. Um, until now, and that not available, um, a <clears throat> uh, an integrated system of controls, where, which is fundamental to making natural ventilation work as a system and tying it into other other systems like the lighting, the lighting controls, and so on. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is the, the kind of the mechanics of the room, that the actuators um, could only, uh, as manufactured in the United States, they only could move, move to fixed positions and they weren't uh, continuously adjusting to the amount of air that was required by the system. So they, the result was a poor control of natural ventilation. Um, and the, the third thing is it was actually kind of a disaster. Um, they, in the classrooms, the actuators were so noisy when they operated, um, it would be very disruptive to uh, the instruction that was going on. So what happened was they disabled the vent natural ventilation in, that, in those rooms, and so they didn't work. Uh, so the problem was really a hardware problem, but uh, it was a lesson learned is find a better actuator and um, Make sure uh, and bring uh, make sure that they work continuously rather than um, just do fixed positions. Um, the second one is a similar project. It was done uh, in Silicon Valley, actually. Uh, it's a little bit warmer down there. Uh, it's similar floor plate, floor plate, but this one is a much more open plan. And they um, it was uh, done as a speculative office building, so. The developer has a very interesting story, which I will not go into, about how the zero net energy design was actually financially, uh, he made more profit on 
the leasing of this building and leasing of this building uh, building um, then he would have if he used conventional systems it's a very interesting uh, I encourage you to uh, read the book it's, it's explained in there very well uh, but I want to st stick to natural ventilation um, in, for today's pres presentation and here's a picture of the existing building it was very similar to the the first case study uh, it had fixed windows it had a solid roof it had uninsulated con concrete walls um, now in this case the designers uh, decided again to use the same strategy it's the same climate so uh, the idea is to have natural ventilation for the cooling and to pre-cool the structure through night ventilation because of a large diurnal swings of temperature. And so, but in this case, they replaced, uh, instead of the uh, intermittent clear stories, they replaced the entire windows. And they also went for the electrochromic or dynamic glass. And I'll show you a picture in a minute if you don't know what that is. Um, and they use uh, especially designed um, skylights and that was quite elaborate and is, is given in a more detailed space um, a case study in the book um, but it's uh, was openable skylights uh, they were, they, so they essentially had the same kind of venting through the through the roof and um, got some cross ventilation that way uh, but they did also insulate sorry they did also insulate the exterior walls and increase the exposed mass for the night purging so it increased that performance uh, aspect of natural ventilation uh, and was a very good idea of course it had some costs associated with uh, refitting the exterior wall the, in the first case study they did not uh, insulate the walls they decided uh, rightly or wrongly that there would be no cost benefit to it but these designers took the extra step of insulating the walls um, and it performed extremely well as a result. And the, the, the last thing that was an addition in this case was the large uh, slow-moving room fans to keep the air moving. And that makes people comfortable at a higher temperature, uh, in, indoor temperature. And so you extend, extend the range of the use of natural ventilation for cooling. So here are the windows. You can see the operators on the windows uh, pushing it out. It's electrochromic glass which electronically, if there is no sun hitting the window, it's a clear glass, and as uh, a sun hits it, it, very, it changes color due to the electronic nature. It's kind of a high-tech window solution, uh, and, it, and given where it was, they wanted to use this uh, solution. Um, so that's the electrochromic glass and the operators, uh, and the cross-ventilation, you can see it down low. Um, and here is the skylights that were custom designed, uh, very unique uh, design. The skylights actually face south and so on. Um, I won't get into it right now, but they had skylights which were operable, which let air um, uh, escape uh, exhaust from the cross ventilation. Um, here's the room fans that they installed. Um, they are quite large and they're very slow moving. And then also a picture of the insulation you can see it's quite thick that they added to the outside to to improve the performance of the night ventilation uh, so the lessons learned same thing um, the they, they did this um, client did not use the consultant who integrated the control systems as I say an integrated control system is not currently available in the US uh, so they had to program it and work with it and that person was brought on board during working drawings during construction uh, documents and working and construction and it took about six months to get the thing to work right and in this case they use a proprietary integration system um, so the problem is that uh, th this natural ventilation system is made up of a kit of parts and the, and someone has to work on it a good programming person and stay with it to make sure that it works right that's that's um, uh, a drawback to uh, what we have at the moment uh, the me mechanical operators um, again had moved only to a number of fixed positions rather than continuously operating um, and uh, oh I guess I only had two big lessons learned but they were very similar to the first case and the third building I want to talk about is um, the, actually a project that I was the project director when I worked for the firm that designed it. 
Um, it's a, a library building in Berkeley, and it's a new building. Um, and here it's only about 10,000 square feet, so it's a little bit easier to handle with, in terms of getting air to the uh, various spaces. There are some interior rooms. Uh, the, the issue here was that the street, it faces on a street that was, it was extremely noisy. And so no, there could be no openable windows. It was a library and had to be quiet. Um, there were no openable windows that could be put in this facade, which is the south facade. And it was hemmed in on, uh, potentially in the future, there'll be a building on the left and there is one now on the right. And uh, the, uh, the only way to get air in and out of this building was in the back, one side, uh, and, um, and the roof. So uh, we have ventilating skylights and we have air intake through the back into the spaces and then some, uh, a unique idea, uh, which is uh, a wind chimney. When you can't get cross ventilation, you can devise a method a strong method to draw the air through the building. And this has been used before, uh, certainly in the Middle East over centuries. Uh, but the mechanical, mechanical engineers suggested this as a possible solution, and that is what uh, we come up with. Um, and we have the mixed mode operation and a large room fans to increase the comfort zone, um, and just like in the other buildings. Uh, I'm sorry. And so this is the key about the wind chimney. Uh, we built it into the front of the building, since it's only a one-story building. And the air comes in through the north side. It's drawn through the building by the prevailing breeze. It's always from the same direction, right from the ocean side. And uh, we're always going to get this kind of airflow during the day, or most of, most of the year, we have this kind of airflow. Um, and we didn't just theorize uh, that the air would move that way. Um, we actually um, tested it using uh, software, um, and there, there is uh, some, this was an early crude version of the software, it's about five years ago, I think, uh, but it did show that this um, airflow would happen, and in this case, it was a different kind of interior shape, but it did show that it worked. Um, and so we went forward with it, and then it's been built, uh, it's been on operation for three or four years, and it does work apparently very well. The mixed mode of operation shows how we used um, the fresh air available through natural ventilation from the heating season in mode one all the way up to the peak cooling season. It has a radiant floor for providing the heat, pump, piping um, warm air, which is delivered by, generated by a heat pump. And, and the cooling side, it, because it's the heat pump, it can um, cool cool water can pipe, pipe through the slab and for that peak cooling event, which right now, even now, still happens only a few days a year. Uh, most of the time we live in a swing season. It's a good climate for, for that and for natural ventilation. So you, you get the air movement, the cooling is provided by air and uh, uh, we also have backup fans, uh, which uh, if you look at mode four, in their poor conditions and the wind is not blowing for some reason, then there is backup low uh, power fans to help it. Um, and uh, we did install some uh, user controlled operable windows uh, in key places uh, because I think there is a factor of the user feeling like they can have some local control and their their own requirements for comfort uh, is important. Um, so that was put in. It doesn't interfere with the overall natural ventilation system, um, but it's a, an important psychological thing to consider. Um, so lessons learned were, again, it'll be repetitive, but um, this is sort of the worst case. There was no um, system integrating person at the beginning, and there was no system integrating person during construction, and it sort of uh, evolved as a problem, naturally, uh, and it turned out that the control systems uh, person was so intrigued by the problem that he spent a lot of time doing what was done by consultants in the previous two projects and, and managed to uh, program the uh, uh, various uh, control systems into the uh, to a central system, and it was thanks to his dedication that the, that that particular issue was solved. So it was the same problem as in the other two buildings, and it, it was resolved. But it took a lot of work, 
um, and um, uh, it's it's something that can be uh, it can't be uh, using um, a, a available uh, products in the US uh, we are having all kinds of problems and um, uh, there there is a solution which uh, Rianic will talk about uh, also the the window operators in this case again only had fixed positions in fact they started that they were either all open or all closed so that so this controls technician worked very hard I get it, but to to get it right. But um, the first response of the owner was um, to raise the threshold of allowable CO2, and then the the building felt very stuffy. So until this problem was stall, solved of the control system, um, they were starting to get complaints from the staff about the building. Um, and the other thing, if you look closely, you can see the actuators on the window, um, and you can see how large they are, and so forth. Um, that was the kind that was available five years ago and specified. Uh, we know a lot more today, and um, and so and of course there are now other products. Again, Yannick will uh, address it. So um, we had three buildings that were um, zero net energy. They uh, did all the right things. They made natural ventilation the strategy, but um, the the problems that all came up, the common problems that came up, they are. They are solvable uh, for the this for these smart buildings, um, and uh, I, I'm going to use this as a transition and hand off to Yannick because he's going to talk about how you can overcome these problems. Really, uh, so Yannick, uh, it's all yours. Thanks, Ed, for for the presentation and uh, thanks for for sharing this uh, these very interesting uh, projects. Uh, and now I will yes move on to, to me and my part of the presentation. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, yeah, and my presentation, I have titled it, uh, Together we can create exceptional natural ventilation solutions for your building. And um, just moving on to the next slide here. <clears throat> so the agenda for my uh, part of this presentation is a, a brief introduction on uh, why we should have natural ventilation and how. And then a very brief uh, introduction also about the, the design and which calculations you can do when you have a natural ventilation or mixed mode uh, solution. And then moving on to uh, the control systems and last but not least some of our, the case studies we have, we have done recently. So first, why should we consider uh, natural or mixed mode uh, ventilation? Um, that's one reason is, of course, we have uh, seen that as that as a, a big part of it is, of course, uh, the energy savings. There are different studies showing that we can actually achieve uh, energy savings of around um, eighty percent compared to a, a complete um, mechanical ventilation solution. Besides that, we can also have a healthy environment. Actually, we can see that we can reduce or natural ventilation can reduce uh, the health saving cost uh, up to 1.3 percent and also reduce the uh, sick building syndrome symptoms uh, with around 65 uh, percent as stated here. Secondly we can uh, perform even better uh, and there has been some tests in, in, in classrooms uh, where it actually show that uh, children where they have in classroom where they have uh, openable windows could actually perform seven to eight percent better on on, on on different test scores also in offices uh, we can see that there has been um, stated a productivity gain of around uh, 18 percent when you have natural or mixed mode solution also we you can also see that we can actually reduce the cost uh, compared to um, a complete mechanical ventilation solution. Actually, we have seen that eight uh, case studies with natural or mixed mode actually can pay, uh, have a payback period of around one year when you uh, combine all the different uh, benefits uh, like energy and product savings and etc. So there are quite a few, uh, you can say, benefits uh, having a natural or mixed mode solution. So when I talk about the natural ventilation, so that's actually <clears throat> based on um, you can say based on indoor air temperature on a CO2 level, on relative humidity, outdoor air temperature, wind speed, wind direction and rain, etc. And of course it is uh, controlled using these uh, actuators which is uh, shown on the on the second picture here uh, where my cursor is. Uh, and these are linked up to, uh, it can be 
um, a dedicated uh, control uh, system. Uh, this one is what we call Envy Comfort, but it can also be uh, a BMS uh, system where it's actually linked up to, to a BMS system. So actually, <clears throat> you can say we have a, a complete solution from the design. We can, com uh, we can uh, also supply the components and we can also, you can say, um, have the control system for, for these kind of buildings. So speaking of natural ventilation, of course, that's one part of it. Another part of it is what we call mixed mode or hybrid ventilation. Um, and, and that term is uh, where we combine the natural with a mechanical ventilation solution, just to get that right. And one slide about window mask and what we actually do. So um, we can say that we are actually in, in, the, in the complete building phase. So just right from the design of a building where we can uh, help um, uh, sorting out which actuator should you use for, for different kind of windows. We can also um, help you with, uh, for instance, <clears throat> do some in energy uh, simulations, some indoor climate simulations, uh, etc. And we can also provide you with the actual solution of the natural ventilation. We can do the, the night cooling of the building and we can do this, this solar screening um, um, control that and I will get back to that a little bit later. Furthermore, we can also do the implementations, uh, for instance, uh, the installation, the commissioning and testing, but also the handover and, and user training, which is also a very important part of it. Last but not least, we have uh, also a service department, which of course can maintain the different um, system we have. So next one, uh, next point is um, about the, the design and calculations. So of course, when you have a, a natural ventilated building, we can see that <clears throat> this size uh, or this uh, left picture here shows the overall system. Um, so of course, you can see the, the very top building or the very top room here, we have what we call cross ventilation. The room down here, we have single sided ventilation. And uh, down here in the, in the atrium, we have what we call stack ventilation. But if we zoom in a little bit on, on one of the room, we can see what it's the essential uh, part of a uh, nat uh, natural ventilation system is, of course, that we have openings to the outside. And, and these openings <clears throat> uh, have we mounted, for instance, or integrated an uh, actuator, which can open and close these windows, depending on a CO2 temperature or relative humidity set point. Uh, and these, uh, the temperature and CO2 and relative humidity is actually measured inside each of the room. Of course, we also have a, a keypad inside the room, so actually the people uh, <clears throat> who are, are present can actually override uh, the system. So if they want to open the windows even further, they can press, yeah, open. If they want to close the windows, they can press, press close. Last but not least, we also have a weather stationing uh, station uh, on, the, on the rooftop measuring wind speed, wind velocity, but also, for instance, temperature. And all of this, based on all of these input, <clears throat> uh, the weather uh, situation, but also the temperature or CO2 inside the room, we can uh, open and close the windows according, accordingly to, to that. So what we always say is that uh, natural ventilation needs to be designed, engineered, but it also needs to be controlled. So we have, of course, seen many, um, <clears throat> many uh, cases where it actually, where natural ventilation has not been thought of in, in the very early design phase, and, and that's also why the, the project might not have been as, as good as intended, at least. So it's very important that, that the natural ventilation is designed. And of course, you can do a, a various different kind of uh, simulation or calculations. Um, uh, yeah, we we, uh, we normally do the, these basic calculations calculations, sorry, in the very early design phase, but also the dynamic simulations uh, is possible uh, with natural ventilation, so you can see, or you can actually see what kind of indoor environment you can achieve throughout a whole year in, in different uh, environments. Also, uh, CFD is possible, and I will get back to that a little bit later. Of course, there are, of course, some uh, requirements in, in, for instance, in US, they have uh, the Tile 24, where it actually says that uh, the natural ventilated spaces should have uh, an openable area of at least 5%. So of course you can use this value as a startup value, 
But again, you need to consider, do we need more openings or and where and how should they be placed? For instance, so this is a, a building. So this is normally what we do in, in the very early design phase. So in blue is here, marked in blue, is actually the, the facade windows uh, which we intend to use for the controlled natural ventilation. In green here, we have a skylight. So you can actually see in, in this uh, breakout room here, uh, we can actually calculate, okay, how many air chains, so how much air can we bring into this room? So this is, of course, depending on, on, on the external wind speed shown here on the x-axis and the temperature difference between the inside and out. And based on this, we can actually read, okay, how many air chains can we have in, inside this room? So this is a very powerful design phase tool that we can uh, use in order to see if we should increase the number of windows or decrease them. Of course, you need to be aware of the design of the openings. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, as you can see here, so uh, normally when we have an openable window, we have a, a, an area here at the, at, the, at the triangles, but we also have this area at, at the re rectangular area, which you can uh, consider as a effective opening, openable area. Of course, you need to consider also uh, the surrounding buildings or the surrounding, uh, uh, yeah, like this ledge here. So as you can see, when we open this window here, we only get uh, the triangles as an effective openable area. So it's very important to take the surroundings into consideration as well. Also solar shading sh sh uh, should be at least thought of. So here you see a picture showing that the internal solar shading is actually fixed to the frame. So it means that we can actually open the windows without having uh, uh, the shading uh, disrupting the airflow. Also down here, the second picture down here, we have external solar shading fixed on the frame which mean we can open these high level windows without having any, you can say, issues with, uh, with the solar shading. Second is, of course, these dynamic simulation. I will just briefly show you this one. So this is a, an, an office building located in the San Francisco area. So in blue is marked uh, the automatic controlled natural ventilation uh, openings. So it's actually every second window which we can open. We have the possibility to have cross ventilation in this particular building, and here is some, um, some, yeah, uh, you can say some uh, input for for this uh, kind of building. For instance, we have uh, we have to provide um, around 17 uh, CFM per person in order to have uh, a CO2 level below 1,000 parts per million. So if we press uh, one, uh, the run button, we can actually analyze how the indoor climate or the temperature would be throughout a whole year, starting from January, January uh, to December. So in green is the outdoor temperature, and in, in blue is actually the, the indoor temperature. And of course, you can see it's quite stable throughout the year, and when the external temperature is rising, the internal temperature is, is rising accordingly, of course, in, in this kind of building. And then, of course, you can say, okay, how much, um, overheating do we have uh, throughout a whole year. So for instance, if we look uh, of the number of hours above 27 degrees uh, Celsius corresponding to 80.6 Fahrenheit, you can say throughout a whole year in the occupied period, uh, we have around 25 hours. So it's not massive actually. So of course, <clears throat> this model can also be improved even further. So if, for instance, we could have changed the gla glazing we could have improved the solar shading, add heavy mass uh, material inside the building, or we could actually also have more openable windows, and these results would of course have been better. But we can actually see that it is actually possible or possible to have an, a really good temperature uh, in an office building located in San Francisco. So going to the third uh, here on my agenda is uh, control systems. So what we have learned uh, from its case studies is actually all linked to, uh, you can say, control system, but also uh, the hardware, meaning the window operator. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I just picked some uh, bullet uh, here from its presentation. So window actuators, are, you can say, are noisy, also vis visible, and uh, the window operators are either fully opened or fully closed, which of course leads to a poor uh, control of the natural insulation. And also, it also mentioned that there's a lack of integration system designed actually to make the natural ventilation system perform perfectly. And these, of course, these um, are something that I will address in the, in the next couple of slides. 
But of course, the most important thing is, of course, that we should um, uh, have the windows uh, with either a surface-mounted uh, actuator on, as you can see here, the very first image. We also have the possibility to act actually integrate the, the actuator into the frame itself uh, in many cases, so it cannot be seen from inside. Of course, we have facade windows, actuators, but also um, uh, skylight actuators, which is quite powerful, can also be used. And of course, we have different possibilities. So here you can see top hung windows up here. Here in yeah, this yellow building where we have parallel opening, openable windows is also very used. Here is a, actually a hotel room where we have a side hung window. So there are multiple different uh, categories and different um, uh, windows. Of course, we can also, um, <clears throat> it's not only in, in new buildings, we can also do retrofit buildings. Um, yeah, here is a very old building in, in downtown Copenhagen. Uh, these, build, uh, these windows up here are, <clears throat> are opened by our actuators, as you can see here on the very last image. So actually, you can see we have surface-mounted two actuators, one on the external window frame and one on the internal window frame, allowing the air actually to enter, to enter the space, to enter the office space behind it. So actually, also retrofit buildings is, is, is a possibility. So here, now I want to talk a little bit about the actual the features or the technology we have built inside of the actuators. So um, these are some of them. <clears throat> so inside the actuators, we have what we call motor link features. So motor link features uh, is, of course, <clears throat> uh, where we actually can control the actuators millimeter by millimeter. Uh, and that is actually the pictures or the images showing this over here. So in many cases, actually, we don't have to open the windows fully. We can actually just open uh, the windows uh, yeah, to a very few degrees and allowing the air uh, or enough air to enter the space. Uh, this is a very important feature uh, <clears throat> for the natural ventilation system in order to make it work and in order not to be drafty here also. Second, uh, we also have uh, incorporated uh, three-speed actuators. So this means that when the the system is in automatic mode, it runs at a very slow speed, meaning that we actually um, have a decibel uh, around 28, uh, around that number. Um, so it's a very, very uh, silent at least. Um, the second speed if, 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 is if um, the, the user then try to override the system, try to open the windows, then he will get, or he or she will get an audio feedback, meaning that we will run even faster uh, speed on our actuators. Second, or the third speed is if we have emergency situation, then we run uh, at 100% speed. Um, yeah, then we also have the possibility to actually have multiple uh, actuators on, on the same windows. As you can see here, we have two actuators mounted on the same windows. Uh, and these are, uh, are interlinked with each other and have a synchronization between them. So when the one actuator is moving, the other one is moving at the same speed also. Then we have the pressure, pressure safety function, which actually reduces uh, the risk of entrapment when, when the actuator is closing. So if the actuator um, uh, detects some resistance, then the, it will, it, the, actuator, uh, sorry, the actuator would stop. And we have several other features. Um, so, of course, <clears throat> all these features can either, uh, for instance, be controlled by a BMS system or interlinked with a, a BMS system using one of these uh, uh, open bus communication protocols, KNX, BACnet, LUN, or Modbus. So this is one possibility. Another possibility is, of course, to use one of our, you can say, our um, control system, which we, uh, yeah, we have two control systems, one is called NV Comfort and another one is called NV Advance. And these control system is actually very dedicated to the control system to control the natural ventilation, uh, actually. But it can also control mechanical ventilation, heating and cooling inside the building, uh, lighting, depending on the looks level inside and outside, solar shading, again, uh, depending on, for instance, the lux, looks level outside. Uh, and then, of course, we have the data logging showing what is, for instance, the temperature, what is the relative humidity inside the space, the CO2 levels, and, and also showing what, um, what set points the different uh, systems are in. 
So these are <clears throat> are some systems that uh, can be it's, uh, can be um, used in, in a building. Also integrated, of course, to uh, to the to the BMS system if that's necessary. So the first one is our in the comfort system. That's a, a, a touch screen here, and that can actually control up to uh, eight zones, uh, and that means eight rooms. And of course, that is as shown here, uh, linked to uh, our actuators, uh, to our automated windows, and also linked to, for instance, the heating, the uh, control. Uh, it can also be linked to the, the mechanical control, etc. And this is actually just the, or this is the interface of the NV Comfort touch panel here. And here you can see actually that the room down here, <coughs> Office 6, uh, actually we control the natural ventilation, we control the uh, the fans, meaning mechanical ventilation. We also control the lighting, and we control also the heating inside the space. Um, <clears throat> yeah, going to the next one. So that's NV Advanced System, which can control uh, uh, quite uh, many zones, uh, an entire building actually. Uh, so this is actually the one is the computer shown up here. With this computer, we have a data exchange, or we have the possibility to have data exchange with, for instance, a BMS, another BMS system, if that's required. And then we also have the possibility to um, uh, to um, to connect to, to this computer from one of our own service uh, computers, and then we can see how the system is actually uh, running. And again, we also have the possibility to connect to other kind of uh, systems like mechanical ventilation, solar shading, lighting, heating, etc. In inside the building. Um, yeah, touching on this one. So actually, for the environment system, we have uh, the openings is actually controlled by an external CFD simulations. So of course, for instance, when we have a high-rise building, uh, we know that the pressure on the very top of the building is not the same as the uh, as, a, as, a, as at low level. So for instance, the windows up here at the very top should, for instance, only open 10% and the windows at the bottom should, for instance, for instance open 50% in order to have the same amount of air entering the space behind it. Furthermore, we also need to take, um, doing these external CFD simulations, we also need to take the, the surroundings into account. So, so for instance, a building like this, <clears throat> here the first image is shown here is actually shown uh, with the wind direction from northeast. So in red here, you, you, we can see that we have overpressure on this uh, on this facade. So this means that we have when we have a window here, we actually make all these readings uh, from this CFD simulations and put them into um, our control systems. So this means that we, when we have a window here, uh, we can see we have overpressure. So this means that when the wind direction is from northeast, the system knows that this window should only open 10%, for instance. When the wind direction then changes to southeast, we can see in here, the same window, we have a slightly under pressure, meaning, for instance, we should open this window 30% uh, in order to get the same amount of air entering uh, the, uh, the room uh, inside, inside the building. So all of these um, all of these pressure uh, readings is then integrated into the environment control, and the uh, the control system then knows how much it should open and close the windows according to the wind direction and also according to the wind speed. So next and the last one is of course some of our case studies we have done. Uh, we have around 700 projects or more than 700 projects around the world um, which have uh, either yeah, natural ventilation or hybrid ventilation uh, solution. Um, of course as you can see here we have um, <clears throat> many different kind of uh, building types. Uh, yeah, for instance we have office building, dwellings, school buildings, also uh, shopping center streets actually. Uh, hotel rooms, and all of these is, uh, yeah, of course, located around the world. Um, but the first one I want to touch on is a, a, a very recent uh, project we have here, is uh, with Harvard University. Uh, yeah, it's uh, located at the Harvard Center for Green Buildings and Cities, and Cities. Uh, and then um, you can see this building is actually a, a retrofit buildings, a building utilizing 100% of natural ventilation. 
so there are no mechanical ventilation uh, inside this building. If we go to this image below here, we can see we have high-level windows here with an um, integrated uh, actuator inside this um, profile here. And then we also have these uh, skylights uh, at the very top here, uh, creating, a, you can say, a stack effect inside uh, this, these rooms. So again, <clears throat> Uh, it's our environment system which control uh, the natural ventilation, of course. But besides that, we also control the solar shading uh, for this building and the heating and cooling uh, integrated into the slab. And of course, this is also very important um, that actually that the natural ventilation and the heating and cooling is actually interlinked with each other. So they are not. Uh, you can say that the natural ventilation don't cool the building and the you can see the, the heating is not on at the same time and, and so on. So it's very important that there is this um, interlink between all these uh, different uh, uh, control systems in the building. Secondly, we also have um, the PNC Tower in Pittsburgh. Uh, this is a double skin facade. Uh, they also uh, use here uh, parallel opening openable windows. Um, so what the air does is actually entering this double skin facade, as you can see here on the on the on the second image, and then throughout these um, uh, grills here, the 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 air enters the double skin facade uh, cavity here and actually <coughs> go uh, down to this uh, below these grills, and then on the inside we have uh, on the third image we have these uh, flaps open, which we can open, and then the air would actually enter the space uh, in this meaning. And they have actually uh, been seeing that they can use natural ventilation for around 45% of the time. Another building which also uses these uh, parallel windows is uh, the Bullet Center in Seattle. Um, and actually, you can see here that we actually push out these quite uh, heavy, uh, large windows here on, on the facade, utilizing uh, cross ventilation uh, of the building. So it's also a very, very, very nice uh, building here. Another one is actually uh, the Baltimore School of Law. So <clears throat> they have uh, a big uh, atrium in the middle of the building, and uh, in the in the facade they also have uh, openable windows. Uh, so it means that the air enters these uh, facade windows uh, and then are being exhausted to this atrium. And they have found out that they can utilize uh, natural insulation for around 40% of the time in, in, that, uh, in that particular case. Of course, we have also many other cases. Uh, these are so, just some of them, uh, and we have many more on our homepage, which you can see. So <clears throat> going to the conclusion, uh, one of the most important thing is, of course, that um, the natural insulation design needs to be taken into consideration in the very early design phase. Um, of course, we have different possibilities to do calculations, but again, it's um, it's, a right, it's about getting the right design uh, yeah, at the start. Secondly, we can also see that the, actually <clears throat> uh, that natural ventilation system, if properly designed, are able to are able to overcome the challenging points, which it actually pointed out, and that actually means that we can have actuators which are invisible or, or at least also silence, and uh, there are also products, uh, actuators, uh, which can be adjusted uh, continuously, so not only meaning full opening and full closing, but you can also have um, yeah, our actuators which can actually provide these uh, features. And the uh, third but last uh, uh, third point here is, of course, <clears throat> another very important feature is that when you have a natural ventilation system, it's very uh, important that this can these system can be integrated uh, to other systems. For instance, for instance, the heating and cooling system, the solar shading system, uh, etc., in in order to get a, a very very good and uh, yeah and stable indoor climate inside. And of course, it is not only us, window master, who can handle this uh, task. Uh, that's also why I wrote this last, that to, together we can create exceptional natural ventilation solution uh, exact for your building. So of course this is a, a whole team effort. It's going from the very early design phase, from the architect to the, um, to the engineers, but also involving, um, for instance, uh, window master or other um, 
uh, com companies. Uh, so, so I think this was my very end slide. Uh, hopefully you have enjoyed it. Uh, we have now the Q and A session, and here you can also see there are some um, uh, some contact details uh, for Edward Dean uh, here. So if you want to, uh, yeah, give him a, a chat, you can have you can do that. Uh, my uh, information is is here and also i have also written my uh, my colleague esteban uh, sancho in who is a, the, the vp of sales in us his contact information are here but i think uh, now it's time for for questions so if you have any questions now is the time to um, to write these in the in, in the question box at the right side of you so it says actually questions and i will just open it right away to see if we have any questions online already. Just a second. Okay, we have a few. Okay, so uh, yes, the first question is actually addressed um, uh, to me. Uh, so that is, uh, which is, uh, software do you use to make the CFD simulations? Uh, that's asked by Nicole. Um, so um, we have different possibilities, uh, but the main, uh, you can say, the main software we actually use is something, a program called SolidWorks, which has uh, this uh, add-on feature for, um, for, the, for the CFD simulations uh, as well. So yeah, so the, the answer is that we use SolidWorks for our uh, CFD simulations, and that's both the external CFD simulations and uh, external uh, CFD simulations. Uh, and then we have uh, Sarah has another question here. Are the actuators already integrated into the window uh, products? And uh, that's, that is a yes and no answer. Um, thank you for that. Uh, the, the yes answer is that um, yes, it can be integrated uh, into the, uh, you can say the window manufacturer perhaps already have a solution where they've integrated the actuator into uh, their profiles. So for instance, uh, Velux, uh, the Skylight manufacturer does that already. Um, but, um, but in many cases, we can see that it is actually not the case. So, um, <clears throat> so we actually need to come up with a, with a design solution. So for instance, how should the actuators be positioned and can it be integrated into the profile itself? So we have a, a team of um, specialized, specialized people which can look at, okay, how can we integrate uh, the actuator into, into the window profile? So yes, sometimes uh, the window products or the, yeah, the window products are with an uh, actuator, uh, but in many cases the window uh, manufacturer uh, doesn't have this uh, solution. Uh, going forth, uh, uh, Sarah asked again, uh, how about uh, for hire? Uh, okay, I'll just read it loud again. So Sarah has a follow-up question, how about for higher end window systems, for instance, uh, Shugo profiles? Uh, yes, Shugo also have a, you can say, uh, actuator, the possibility to buy a uh, a profile f from them, which have an uh, integrated uh, actuator inside of that. Um, it's not our brand, but <clears throat> so it doesn't necessarily have all the features which I just mentioned. Uh, but we also have the possibility to integrate our uh, actuators into the Sugar profile, which we also have done in, in several projects. So yes, in high-end window systems might have the possibility, but uh, in some cases, they don't. Uh, let's see here. Okay, I see. Thank you, uh, Sarah says. Um, uh, and then we have another question. Does your BMS uh, uses PID parameters or just PI? So, uh, yeah, that's a, actually, that question leads on to a, another webinar we also have. Um, but uh, it can be... Uh, actually it can be both of them. So depending on what we actually control uh, inside the building, we have different control uh, possibility, either to have it uh, done by the PI, uh, quite simple, or actually also to have the PID uh, yeah, as, a, as a possibility. Uh, 
but perhaps uh, yeah, we, we, we can have a chat about that a little bit later because that's actually a, an, another whole session. Um, but actually our system uses both depending on what we actually control in, in the building. So I also have a question here for, that's actually not for me, that's for Ed. I think uh, we still need, we can still have, even though we are on time now, I think we just take a, a few more questions uh, here. Uh, so this one is for Ed. So uh, uh, just reading it loud here. Um, it says, uh, <clears throat> the case studies you have shown uh, is, uh, oh, sorry, there it was again. Uh, yeah, the case studies you have shown is is mainly with those with with are not functioning right. Uh, are there any of the uh, cases in your book that actually also have, have a, a a good or a perfect natural ventilation system? Um, well, uh, first of all, let me just say that they they are all functioning correctly. Um, but uh, it, it took some work and an understanding of um, the programming uh, necessary and uh, either a special person on board from the beginning or came in after, which was harder to adjust the system. But they all ended up uh, working fine. Uh, the real point was that they, they, they were not aware of or, in, or it was not available even to use a fully integrated um, system as Yannick just described uh, that is now available and all of that headache could have could have been avoided uh, if, if we had then what we have now the possibility to use um, uh, there were there are about there are over 20 case studies and uh, I I don't think I, I cannot think of one uh, yet that um, utilizes a system as uh, integrated and straightforward as uh, the window master system. So it's one of the reasons that um, I personally am very interested in uh, seeing it applied in uh, zero net energy buildings as we go forward and build more of them. Okay. I hope, that, I hope that was a good answer. Yeah, it was a very good answer. At least I, I thought so. So uh, I think we have another one for you, Ed. So you you mentioned the the books. Uh, where 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 can those be bought? Does it say? Uh, oh, well, the best yeah, yeah the best uh, place right now is on Amazon. And if you Google, oh, sorry, if you type in on the Amazon website uh, under books, uh, zero net energy buildings or zero net energy case study buildings, uh, they'll come up there. And there's two there now, and in about in a few months there'll be four including one on residential projects. Okay, perfect, perfect. I think we'll take the last question here, that's from uh, Enrico. Um, just read it out here. Have you ever uh, evaluated the ventilation of old massive buildings in hot plus humid uh, and cold plus humid climates? Um, this is for me or? It can be for you and for me. So have, yeah. have you done that? And no, it's not humid. It's not humid in California, so uh, I haven't had the chance to do that. Uh, oh. It would it would be wonderful to uh, look at such a building. Yeah, um, actually, we we have done some you can say evaluation of that, and in some cases, um, uh, you can say that <clears throat> uh, you you can have some. Uh, material which can absorb to to some extent the hu humidity, um, but again, you need to think about um, the, the the building as one. So of course, in in, in these hot and humid climates, uh, sometimes it's not a possibility to have uh, the natural ventilation uh, solution uh, during the daytime. Perhaps you can use it during the nighttime, or you can use use it uh, during a, yeah another part of the year where it's not hot and humid. But I think uh, if you Google hot and humid uh, climate plus natural ventilation, I think there should be a report on that as far as I remember. Okay, uh, just see if there are quite a few um, questions still uh, waiting. Uh, I'm not sure if we have the time. We are going five minutes above the actual time. Um, I think we'd, we'd take the, the last one. The very, very last one. That's from Nicole. Um, here writing that, do you have, do you simulate the whole building or just part of it when you do the internal CFD simulation? 
Um, yeah, so actually, we <clears throat> depending on, on how precise it's going to be, uh, but normally we would just take one room uh, and do the internal CFD simulation for that particular room, uh, yeah, where we do, uh, you can see where we have like a, a, a wind tunnel uh, yeah, built up inside our CFD simulation software tool. But of course, it, it, a possibility is also to have uh, the full model uh, inside uh, in, inside uh, inside the, the the software and do and do that uh, as well. Um, yeah, I think that was the last question um, due to the time limit here. Um, but <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for 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 listening in to this, and uh, thank you Ed for participating and giving us a very interesting presentation also and um, if you have any further questions uh, you are more than welcome to contact uh, one of us uh, you have the contact information here and also um, uh, we can send you the the slide uh, <clears throat> yeah the slides show uh, the slides which we have actually have uh, done here we can send them to you by mail and also uh, in a couple of days uh, hopefully uh, this uh, recorded uh, webinar would also be available uh, on different uh, on our homepage and, and different other places but thank you for listening in and uh, thank you Ed for participating uh, very interesting as well okay thank you very much and uh, have a nice day and uh, hopefully see you at our next webinar bye bye